Shields up, Ironbreakers. Welcome back to Elden Ring, and today we're going to be talking about everything we know so far about its upcoming expansion, Shadow of the Earth Tree. And make no mistake, this is going to be a full-fledged expansion and not just a piece of DLC. We're going to be delving into all of that a little bit further ahead in the video. For now, before we actually dive into the specifics, I would like to bring up a quote that I've seen throughout all of the interviews that I've read. This was on the IGN interview, and this is relevant to the current version of Elden Ring. So the interviewer says, For now, fans will have to look forward to Shadow of the Earth Tree, which finally arrives this summer after a two-year wait. If you're so inclined, you can start a new game of Elden Ring to prepare yourself, though we asked Miyazaki if there were any remaining mysteries left for players to find in the current version of The Lands Between. While Miyazaki says he doesn't think there's anything that hasn't been discovered by now, highlighting how E and the devs are always surprised and delighted by how much the players do discover and how much these communities work to uncover these secrets, there might be one small thing he hasn't seen yet. And this is a quote from Miyazaki. For me personally, there's a small element that I feel has not yet been discovered. So whether that's up to user interpretation or up to further investigation and playing, that's something I'm looking forward to. But he adds, I think it's a question of when and not if, but there may be something small still missing. Of course, Miyazaki will trust you to figure out what that means. I'm actually curious what your opinion is on this. Uh, if you guys are thinking that Miyazaki is actually being sincere, if he's pulling another one, oh yeah, I think that the talisman is the best thing. I forget that the, the Dark Souls reference that he would always say, oh, this thing is like the best thing that you should get, and it was a complete troll because there was actually no use for that particular item, and every player was currently scouring through the game trying to find uses for it. I'm sure that a lot of you guys remember that. Makes me wonder if that is what Miyazaki is pulling with this particular quote but anyways let's get back to the specifics of shadow of the earth tree when's the release date as mentioned in that uh, particular quote there it is in the summer it's going to be on the 21st of june thank god gives us plenty of time to prepare gives us a clean runway and plenty of time afterwards as far as i'm aware to just play through the game enjoy it explore it do multiple builds do multiple runs at the lc i think it's going to be an absolute blast but 21st of june is the date that we're looking at and one of the reasons that i made specific point of saying that this is going to be an expansion not just a piece of dlc is because that is the language that from software themselves are using but also because of the price point this is set at 40 dollars which is quite a lot but i believe that we're going to be getting a sizable chunk of content and that is going to be one of the specific things that we're going to be getting into as we move throughout this video we're also going to be analyzing the trailer here once again and i'm going to be bringing additional details that i've dug through and i'm theory crafting through and all of that stuff but let's get started by reading the first flavor text that we have here on the official website for Shadow of the Earth Tree. We have this little piece of text here that says, Fall from grace, the land of shadow, a place obscured by the Earth Tree, where goddess America first set foot, a land purged in an unsung battle, set ablaze by Mesmer's flame. It was to this land that McKellar departed, divesting himself of his flesh, his strength, his lineage of all things golden. And now Michaela awaits the return of his promised Lord. Now, one of the important things that I want you guys to keep in mind is this. Divesting himself of his flesh, his strength, his lineage of all things golden. Because that's going to come into play a little bit later as we watch the trailer. So a couple of more key things here. We have some of the uh, accolades of the game, naturally. And one of the things that they mention is Elden Ring Shadow of the Earth Tree DLC is from software's largest expansion to date where players must unravel the hidden mystery of the world from the acclaimed final uh, from the acclaimed uh, fantasy action RPG. So this is the biggest expansion they've ever done, which is quite impressive. They're, we're going to be repeating that throughout a couple of quotes that I have from Miyazaki here, by the way. So the key features, new story guided by the Imperian Mikola. Players are beckoned to the land of shadow, a place obscured by the earth tree where the goddess Merica first set foot. So this is where Merica came from. And this brings about a lot of lore theories and stuff i'm i'm imagining that we're going to be seeing tons of lore speculation videos in the weeks ahead leading up to the release of the game in these strange new lands players discover the dark secrets of the world as they meet others who follow in Mikola's footsteps with ulterior motives Exploring a familiar world full of new secrets, Shadow of the Earth Tree takes players beyond the lands between to explore the land of shadow, a completely new world from Elden Ring. Players can seamlessly travel back and forth between its vast maps, interspersed with diverse situations and meticulous dungeons where menacing enemies roam. 
Further and deepened RPG, new weapons, you know, the usual stuff that we expect to get from DLC whenever it comes to a From Software game. And then we have like all of the collector's editions and all of that stuff. These, these are the things that we have on the official website, which is rather nice. But let's start by talking about George R. R. Martin, because this is one of the things that people were curious about. In creating the story of DLC, this is from the Famitsu interview, by the way. In creating the story of DLC, was George R. R. Martin involved as well? Martin's involvement, it is the same as the main game. That is to say that basically he wrote just the basic mythos. So the world and story of the DLC, like those of the main game, were built from the mythology he wrote. More precisely, part of what was built from his mythology during the production of the main game is this DLC. So there was no additional writing specifically for this DLC, which means that George R. R. Martin didn't write anything new. All of the stuff was already written. They're just pulling from those threads and coming up with their own story. Which, by the way, it's important to mention that while George R. R. Martin wrote the mythos, the story itself was created by Miyazaki and his team. The story that we get in Elden Ring was created by Miyazaki. George R. R. Martin wrote the lore, the mythos, the, the backdrop of the world. And then, you know, Miyazaki brought forth his own interpretation of the characters, which is what we're getting now with Shadow of the Earth Tree, right? In terms of development... Shadow of the Earth Tree was announced on February 28th, 2023, but now after a year, the release date has finally been announced. First, I'd like to ask when you started developing it. I think we started imagining the development of the DLC towards the end of the main game's development. Within the overall concept of Elden Ring, there were parts that clearly could not be included in the main game, and I thought it would be nice to release those parts as DLC. However, at that time, it was just an image, and we were focused on developing the main game. The actual development of DLC began after the main game was released and after updates had somewhat settled down. So this is to say, when they were wrapping things up, they were like, man, there's so much more things that we want to put in this game, but we just can't fit anymore. We got to release. At some point, you got to release. Because you can run into the, you know, you can run into a point where you're just like, oh, let's add more things and more things and feature creep and it doesn't stop. To be honest, this video kind of suffered from that for a little bit. I've been two days rereading these interviews, trying to draw more meaning from them. And I was about to go for another day without actually making the friggin' video. So I myself am suffering a little bit from this. So yeah. Now, Another thing, the first thing that caught my attention, this again from the Famitsu interview, upon hearing the title was the meaning of the subtitle Shadow of the Earth Tree. The Earth Tree refers to the golden tree that appears in the main game. So if you translate the DLC subtitle directly, it becomes the Shadow of the Golden Tree. This, by the way, is a chat GPT translation, so it might not be 100% accurate, but I think we get the meaning of what is being said here. In the concept art released in February 2023, the shadow of the golden tree, also called the shadow tree, is looming in the back left. They're talking about this image, if I'm not mistaken, right? You can see that we have the shadow tree over here on the top left, and we have Mikola here on Torrent. It is confirmed that this is Mikola, uh, by the way, on another quote. We'll, I'll show that in just a second. Uh, also called Shadow Trees Looming in the Back Left. The setting of the DLC is not the interim. The interim here, I'm pretty sure that this was supposed to be the lands between, symbolized by the golden tree, but the land of shadows, symbolized by the shadow tree. Now, I actually think that there's a bit of a mistranslation here. I don't think it's land of shadows. I think it's lands of shadow, because they talk about that in the website. I, I remember seeing it. Actually, it's just Land of Shadow. It's not even Lands of Shadow. It is Land of Shadow. But the point is, it is not Land of Shadows, Land of Shadow. Because it is different. Because for a second, I was starting to follow down on the thread that, you know how the Empyreans, each Empyrean gets their own shadow. And I was like, oh, do the shadows come from the Land of Shadows? But no, I don't think that that is the case at all. Symbolized by the Shadow Tree. There's a, also a bit more hidden meaning in the subtitle, but I hope players will experience that in the actual gameplay. So one of the things is, I kind of feel like there's a, a bit of a parallel here, which is being drawn in the, in the form of the lands between are on the light of the earth tree. You know, they're basically being lit up by the earth tree. Whereas the land of shadows is in the shadow of the earth tree. Now, naturally, consider, if you look at the earth tree, right, it's just a golden tree. It shines light in every single direction. Which direction wouldn't the Earth Tree shine light on? It would have to be underground. 
Now, I don't know if this means that, you know, this is somewhere underground or what the deal is, because obviously we see clear skies and all of that stuff. To me, it reminds me a little bit of, you know how in Stranger Things you have the upside down world? I almost feel like that is what the Land of Shadows is. Now, exactly how that is going to be ex explained in game or all of that, I, I don't actually know. But the, the thing is, it also got me thinking about the concept of yin and yang. So if you guys know you have your yin, you have your yang, darkness, light, all of that stuff. Light of the earth tree, shadow of the earth tree. And, you know, kind of like there requires a, a certain balance because otherwise things go out of whack. And fundamentally, I think that Merica leaving the land of shadow with whatever she ended up doing on the lands between that probably upset the balance. And that is probably going to be directly related to the tree of shadow that we see in the shadow of the earth tree and how it's like all corrupted and rippled together with another tree and all of that stuff. I think that that is going to be the story that is going to be explained there. Now, like I said, it is confirmed that this here is Mikola. I mean, everybody was saying that this is Mikola, uh, but Miyazaki did confirm it in the interview. Another question related to the art, is the person writing the Trent Demigod, again, this is a mistranslation, I'm pretty sure that they're saying, is the person writing the Torrent Demigod Mikola of the Sacred Tree mentioned in the main game? Yes, that's correct. Mikola is the main focus of the story depicted in the CLC. Not sure if you remember, but the story of the main game was simply guided by blessings. This time, it's about following the footsteps of Mikola, who went to the Land of Shadows. NPCs who follow Mikola's uh, footsteps will also appear. They will serve as narrators of the DLC story, interact with the protagonist, and sometimes become friends or enemies. Pretty much what we, ex what we expect from, from software NPCs. Another main focus of the DLC story is the past of the Land of Shadow and Queen Merica. And this is very important because if we actually start looking into Queen Merica, which I feel like I'm getting ahead of myself, I should get to the trailer, but whatever. I'm just, you know, I'm just going for it. Queen Merica the Eternal is the reigning divine sovereign of the lands between the vessel for the Elden Ring or offspring possessed them, he got status and bears of the great runes. But the important thing is here, Queen Merica was originally of the same stock as the Newman people, who are the Newman. The Numen, Marevito, which describes rare human, they're said to have come from outside the lands between, from a place known as the lands of the Numen. Now, I don't know what, what is about the word Numen, but something about the word Numen to me just speaks out darkness. I don't know why that is, but one of the things that they, they said here, they have a bunch of references for Newman and stuff like that, and one of the ones that speaks to me is the name Newman may be a reference to the Numenorians of J.R.R. Tolkien's Lord of the Rings series. The Numenorians were long-lived humans that inhabited Numenor, an island realm off the western coast of Middle-earth, and were known for their incredibly long lifespans, which is the case for Queen Merica as well as her offspring. They, they literally can't die, although that is also because she removed the rune of death from the Elden Ring and all that stuff, created the Golden Order, etc., etc. I'm not the best lore buff when it comes to that stuff, but most people are aware, right? And then incredible height, averaging seven feet, which is actually another thing when it comes to the offspring of Queen Merica. They're tall. They're pretty big. You know, even if you look at Melania, Melania, very tall, you know? So, you know, just uh, just a, another little tidbit. So I suspect that these Newman and Merica herself came from the Land of Shadow. And by the way, the Newman are also the Black Knife assassins. They were all women who were rumored to be Newman who had close ties with Queen Merica. So all of these people who came from the Land of Shadow, again, uh, theoretically, were then convinced by Ronnie to, you know, do the Black, the, the Night of the Black Knives and all that stuff, kill Godwin so that Ronnie could escape the fate of the Three Fingers and all of that, which is interesting. It's interesting stuff to kind of like theorize around and talk about and whatnot. But let's actually get to the trailer itself, shall we?
pure and radiant. He wields love to shrive clean the hearts of men. Now, and here they're referring, they're ref referring to Mikola. Pure and radiant, he wields his heart to shrive clean the hearts of men. Basically saying that um, Mikola is able to use his heart, love, to shrive. Shrive, as a verb, I, I looked it up before this video, which is something to do with like confession, absolving one of sin, or whatever. But I think that the idea is that he's able to convince people to basically do what he wants by using love as a weapon. Which is interesting because I did a podcast with Ratatoskr, and he hypothesized that Mikola is actually the one who manipulated Mog to go and remove him from the cocoon of the tree and bring him here. I'm again, I'm not sure this is all like wild theories, but you know, just thought I'd bring that up as well. There is nothing more terrifying. There's nothing more terrifying than his power to basically convince people to do whatever the hell he wants. And by the way, another thing that I neglected to mention, just because I've been looking at this information for so long that I just assume people are aware, this is the entry point to the DLC. It's been officially confirmed. Uh, we have here, how do we access these areas? Oops. How do we access these areas? Miyazaki, the fields are not connected directly from the main game's fields, but are accessed through teleportation. The entrance is the large cracked cocoon or the withered harm hanging from it, which was the stage for the battle, the Blood Lord Mog. Also, to add the DLC fields, you need to have the feet of the Blood Lord Mog and the Starbreaker Radon. So these are two bosses that you have to kill. Despite the fact that you don't necessarily need to kill Radon to get the Mog, there are ways that you can go about getting there without killing Radon. Uh, Miyazaki is saying, no, you got to kill Radon. Probably there's going to be a quest item or something like that. Is it possible to go back and forth between the main game's fields and DLC's fields? Yes, it's possible. As I mentioned earlier, the main game's fields and DLC fields are not connected, are not directly connected. I think that this is mostly for uh, development purposes, although it could also be because it is the upside down world and there's no way to just represent that in the other world. Uh, but I was also thinking, even if it's like a distant land, it would require them to, you know, do the thing that they always do where you can see things off in the distance so that you know that you can get to them. And having to figure that stuff out with all of the stuff that you can already see in Elden Ring could be too complicated, but, you know. Uh, moving between them is done through teleportation, but it can be done freely. What about fast travel? It's the same as the main game. You discover grace, you can teleport to them. Now, one of the things that I was wondering is whether or not you can teleport from one place to the next or you have to go through some uh you know portal but the way that they've always done it in all of their games they never really force you to go to the portal to go back and then go back to the portal to go back it's usually just like no just teleport through grace and whatnot and you're good to go so i'm pretty sure they're going to be doing the same thing again another thing that i got thinking when i saw this this thing was i went and i watched uh mog's cutscene when you first get here and basically, the, the withered arm starts bleeding, forms a pool of blood in the ground. Mog comes out of it, right? And then Mog says, oh, you have to abide alone for a while. Makes me wonder if maybe Mog was with Mikola in the Land of Shadow. If that was a thing that was actually happening, or if it's just a different reference. He also talks about how this is the birthplace of his dynasty. You know, because there are certain themes about what Mog wants to do with Mikola and all of that stuff, but I'm wondering if the Land of Shadow has a connection to all of those lines. But, yeah, that's still a lot of stuff that is just bubbling around in my head. So I wanted to pause here for just a, a couple of seconds. Um, this right here, as we can see, this is the la the, the land of shadow. This is where we're going to be uh, playing throughout the DLC and all of that stuff. We can already see some potentially death route around here and just state of decay that everything is in the cor I would almost say corrupted tree, the shadow tree, which you know lives in the shadow as opposed to uh, living in the light. Also, notice how there's light coming in from the top. Right? 
as opposed to light being given off by the tree and the tree branches. The light here is coming off from the top, which again, maybe it's the upside down world, but it's above the lands between as opposed to being below in the underground, you know, and that's why there's light shining directly down through here. Um, but yeah, one of the things that people are questioning is like, oh, does the game take place in the past? Like, what is the deal with that? Is it going to be in the past and the future? Because, you know, from software is known to sometimes play fast and loose with the concept of time. You know, time flows uh, in strange ways in the land of Lord and whatnot. A lot of information to be revealed this time, so please tell us more. You mentioned Queen America's past earlier. Does the DLC timeline take place in the past? No, the timeline is the same as the main game. It is not set in the distant past or future. The Land of Shadows and Queen America's past will be narrated similarly to the history of the Shattering War in the main game. So this all takes place in the same timeline. Another thing is you look at the all of the stuff that we can see here and you're like, oh, this looks like a pretty big stretch of land. And again, Miyazaki has something to say. I'm curious about the volume of the DLC since Dark Souls 3 and Bloodborne were released about a year after the main game, and this one's released two years after the main game. I have quite high expectations this time. Yes, I'm sorry to have kept you waiting. However, in terms of volume, this DLC is clearly larger than those of Dark Souls series or Bloodborne. It is undoubtedly the largest DLC we've ever made. That's beyond our expectations. Why did it become such a massive volume? When we thought about delivering an Elden Ring-like experience in the DLC, we felt the current volume was necessary. See, that's the thing about Elden Ring, right? When you're talking about Elden Ring, it's not the same experience that we've had with other Souls games. And in a lot of ways, this actually divides the community a little bit because some people like it, some people don't. Some people prefer the more... Uh, I don't want to say straightforward because the games are never really linear. They always give you the freedom to go wherever you want, but the more condensed experience of previous from software titles, like a Dark Souls, something like that. It's not a traditional open world. Then again, Elden Ring's not a traditional open world either, but there's just the vastness, right? There's a, a certain set of scale to it when it comes to Elden Ring. And that is why this DLC took so long for them to get done. It is because... This is a huge scale project because they needed to do so in order to justify the same feeling of awe when you first arrive at Limgrave, your very first time. Like, I don't know if you guys remember the first time that, like, I went up the elevator in the, the network test thing and I opened the door and I was just like, you know, because you, you, just, you just see all of the fields of Limgrave in front of you and you just start galloping forward and trying to figure out a direction where am i going to go what is going on it's just that feeling of awe and that is what they're trying to recapture with the dlc they want to make sure that you get here and you're gonna be like oh man look at all the things that i can do it wouldn't work if it was something more compact and condensed like what we're used to with these games right but anyways, uh, there are threats to overcome, freedom to challenge them, excitement in exploring the unknown, and discoveries and encounters beyond exploration. That's the sense of adventure characteristic of Elden Ring. Again, there's a certain set of awe. There's going to be a lot of boss fights, a lot of things to do. I'm excited to experience that thrill again. What will the fields introduced into the DLC be like? We have prepared new fields different from those in the main game. Of course, there are open fields as well as legacy dungeons. Now, for those of you that don't remember, because maybe you played Elden Ring a while ago and don't remember this stuff, Legacy Dungeons refers to something like a Stormvale Castle. If you remember how big Stormvale Castle is, that's a Legacy Dungeon. And here they're talking about those, plural. So at least two, maybe three, maybe four. I was talking about this with Cowboy as well on a podcast that I did, and Cowboy is thinking like a minimum of three. I was thinking maybe even four. So like three that you're expected to go to, and then a fourth optional one that's going to have a really hard boss in it. You know, that's that's what I'm expecting. They are larger and more diverse than Limgrave in the main game. Now, I don't remember exactly if I have the quote here, but they also mentioned that this... Um, the, the transitions in the in the fields of Shadow of the Earth Tree are going to be more seamless. It's not going to be something as like, oh, now I'm inside Stormvale, right? It's going to be more seamless. It's going to be something that you're going to just more organically traverse the world, and maybe you don't even realize that you're inside a dungeon. That's what they're saying. And at the same time, it is going to be more densely packed. So while there are open fields, I'm thinking there's going to be less negative space. 
which the concept of negative space, for those of you who know, is just like it's empty space with nothing on it. And Elden Ring has a lot of it, which I think is important for the sense of scale. But because of what they're doing with this, which is not the same size as the entirety of Elden Ring, naturally, they are making sure that, you know, it's going to be more densely packed. So I think that for a lot of people, maybe the people that prefer the the old school style of from software level design, I think they're going to enjoy Shadow of the Earth Tree more than the base game of Elden Ring. But again, speculation, take it with a grain of salt, all of that stuff just based on some of the information that I've seen so far. Now, another thing that I want to bring up is if you pay attention here, we have a veil, right? There's this veil coming in from the sky. This is actually not just for aesthetic purposes. There's a meaning behind it. And Miyazaki talks about that in the Famitsu interview as well. And the new art, the background features something like a veil in the sky. Yes, the Land of Shadows, the setting of the DLC, is isolated from the interim. Again, interim just means the lands between the setting of the main game. It's imagined as being cut off and hidden from the outside, and that veil symbolizes it. Now, one of the things that I'm really curious about is exactly why Merica uh, has hidden it, because I get a feeling that Merica is the one who hid this place, who, s who separated it, in order, and it was needed for her to create the, the Earth Tree or to do whatever she wanted to do with the Earth Tree in the lands between. What that is, we're going to find out in DLC. Another interesting thing that uh, was brought up in several videos that I saw was uh, that this veil is also symbolized in Merica's bedchamber. If you go to Merica's bedchamber in the game, this is what it looks like. She's got like this veil thing going on. She also has light coming in from the top, right? This is probably... I don't remember exactly what this light is. I don't know if there's a hole in there or not, but it almost seems like it's the light of the earth tree itself coming in through here. And you have the, the veil very much like the sky that you have in here with the light. So could this light be light of the earth tree? That's, I, I don't know. I don't know. But, uh, you know, that's just uh, an, another little bit of a, of a detail. Now, this, this thing, I'm not exactly sure what this is. Uh, this thing here appears important for sure, but I don't know just how important this is going to be. It, it, for some reason, whenever I see this, it just reminds me of Sailor Moon. <laughs> it's just like I see this thing and I just think, oh, look, it's something out of Sailor Moon in my Elden Ring game, but I don't actually know what the the point of that is but you do get a good view of like the 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 shadow or tree whatever you want to call it and i still have a, a feeling that at some point let me just go back a little bit here i have a feeling that at some point considering the the way that this tree is like this right like an l i think that at some point we're gonna go all the way up here but we'll see if that's the case or not. I think I might have this a little bit too Enough loud. For sake. I might have this a little bit too loud. My apologies, team. In place. So here we have an NPC, and I want you to pay attention to the garb on his or her back. I'm not exactly sure if this is a male or a female NPC, but either way, uh, pay attention to the, the cape on her back, and you're going to be seeing that a little bit further ahead in, in the video. In that forsaken place. And here we have Jesus going back too much. In that forsaken place. And here we have someone that the moment I saw this, for some reason I just got reminded of Hawkeye Goff. I can't be the only one. You look at this dude and like, oh, it almost looks like Hawkeye Goff. And he's got like this jar here, but it's not one of the living jars because the, the form of it is very different. So I'm not exactly sure what this dude is doing. Maybe, maybe he throws down the jars like the giants on top of Sense Fortis. He throws these jars at you. Another thing is pay attention to this, uh, this kind of like corkscrew design because that's going to come into play later as well. Okay, so here we have some of uh, St. Trina's lilies right here uh, in, the, in the background. You can actually see those. Uh, and this was actually mentioned in Zeo Storm's video as well. He talked about that in the, in the next slide that we're about to see. Not exactly sure about this character here on the ground. 
But some tells me that there's going to be a boss fight. Blood it's monster. wearing a mask very much like Vare, very much like a lot of characters in Elden Ring. They like to wear yeah. their masks. Blood of your fellow. This, I have no idea what this is. This character, I've, I've got nothing. I've looked at all the stuff from this. No idea. And here we have the traditional poison swamp. And like I told you, if you paid attention to that NPC's cape, this is what we're using here. So we're going to be able to get the armor from that NPC at some point. Whether we do that, you know, in a proper way or in a... Listen, that's a really nice cape you got there, way. I mean, you know. Uh, but yeah, we got the poison swamp. This looks like it's going to be some type of death blighted swamp. And an interesting thing was in the website, there were a couple of additional pictures. And you got this dude, which appears to be in the same swamp. So this is probably going to be one of the enemies that you're going to be facing off against in that swamp. And this enemy actually reminds me a little bit of the worm faces almost. The way that he's like, you know, hunched down and all of that stuff. I hope my window is not about to explode. For some reason, it keeps giving me this this, this spinning blue logo. But like, I even have the, the worm face thing here open. We're going to be talking about those guys in a second, but yeah. So, and here, one of the things that Zyodstorm brought up is that this looked like uh, there was some Saint Trina symbology here. I'm not exactly sure if that's the case or not. Maybe uh, I'm going to leave my, my mind open to that, but I don't know. I just don't, I have no idea what these, these are. And here we see the actual living jars. This is the actual design of the living jars. Not sure if this is maybe where they are created because, you know, essentially inside the living jars, it's just like the innards of humans. And, you know, like, for instance, Alexander, right, the big jar, he's chock full of uh, the guts and innards of other warriors. And that's why he wants to be a big warrior, right? But yeah, you got the you got these jars over here. I'm not sure if this is how they're making them or if they're maybe using them to extract resources or what is going on here. But yeah, like lots of jars. In here, I thought it was interesting that we have this big pipe coming down all the way to the lava. And there's a centrifugal uh, fan here that could potentially be harvesting the lava, pulling it upwards so that they use it on some machinery or something like that. Uh, and here we see the player character. He's wielding like uh, some type of a spear or something in its left hand and a rapier in the right hand. And this thing appears to be the sheath for the rapier or something. Never so this appears to be one of the, the big cities that you see. And if you guys remember, I told you to pay attention to that uh, corkscrew design where the big giant dude was with the jar. So potentially he could be down here because, you know, you have the pillar here. Seem like this would be a potential place where it'd be. Maybe he's an NPC that we get to interact with. I don't know. But one of the things that you can see in this particular section, right, is you can see some dark roots there. Could these this be death root? And then you also see some floating stones, very much reminiscent of another place called Farum, uh, Farum Azula. Giant Temple in the Sky located above the Seat of the West of the Lands Between, once a royal city and the Seat of the Dragon Lord Placidusax, Faramazula has been crumbling since time immemorial. So there is some time nonsensory going on here, maybe, potentially. Some uh, time traveling or some time dilution shenanigans that is happening in here, and that's why this place is like also being uh, shredded, destroyed, whatever. Uh, or maybe it is... Even considering that, could this be an alternate version of Fair Missoula? I don't know. There's just like a lot of things in here that indicate some type of relationship between this place and Fair Missoula. So if you look at this, as well as Beastman, Fair Missoula is home to a number of ancient dragons, a roost in the floating fragments of the city. It's also a population of worm faces dwelling on one of the lower levels of the city. It appears that Death Root has spread throughout parts of the city as well. Death Root. Worm faces, like the one that we're about to see in the trailer fairly soon. But before that, we also have our boy here, the fire giant. And this was in the IGN interview. They were asking Miyazaki about the bosses. So he's just asking about, first off, tell me about the giant basket of flaming kindling. Okay, so this giant basket of flame, as you so eloquently put it, Mitchell, was a terrible weapon you used in a war. I find it weird that Miyazaki would 
say Mitchell. I don't know. Maybe this is some weird translation thing. I don't think usually Japanese people speak like this, but whatever. Was a terrible weapon you used in a war that occurred in the land of shadow. Basically. So again, without saying too much, we can't give away the name just yet officially, but yes, it was a really gruesome weapon that was used, and the kindling that you see is actually the remains of bodies that were put in there to burn. So there's that friendly fellow. So an interesting thing about this, even though we see him here, happens to be on the losing side of a war. The way that you see that particular creature, it feels like it's very much a boss fight, this happens right? To be on the losing side of a war. So this looks like a boss fight, and it might even be a boss fight, but there's another version of him that we see on the official website where he's just chilling, walking around with a couple of uh, knights and stuff, and they're just all chilling, patrolling. Is this the one that you fight for the boss fight, or is that just one of many? Because at the end of the day, it is a weapon of war that is essentially being fueled by the corpses. I can imagine them just like slam dunking corpses in here. So these knights would kill people, and then they'd be like, okay, now eat them into the our big war lumbering war machine. And that's how we fuel it. It's pretty friggin' wild, but yeah. I think what this image tells me is that likely you will see this dude more than once. Or maybe that's just how you begin his fight. You go ahead, you fight him, it is what it is. I don't know. Shall see. So here we have one of the leech dudes that is kind of like eating this dude's face. You can also see this guy like one, two, three, four eyeballs. He's got four eyeballs in here. He's got really long arms. Which again, if you remember, one of the things that they said about the Newman is that they are taller than usual. Now, I'm not sure if this is some type of potentially mutated Newman that evolved into this sucky creature thingamajig, but they do look somewhat reminiscent, even though he's got like a snaky body that goes all the way here, right? So it's not really super reminiscent of Wormface, but you guys do remember these dudes, right? They puke out death and all of that stuff, and they leave gold poop and a sacrificial twig. I don't know if there's actually any relationship with them, but this is the first thing that comes to mind when I think about these dudes. And again, remember that these dudes were found in Farrah, Missoula. So, you know. Oh yeah, he also talks about that little leech worm dude. But he doesn't say much. It's hard to talk about some of these enemies without spoiling anything. Hopefully you understand. But there's a significant connection between these enemies, the way they are and the land of shadow. Now here, it's important that you notice how in this particular section, dude, there's actually a hand that closes the mouth, right? Because initially I thought that this was actually just some type of dude that had gotten mutated and transformed into this dog-like creature. For starters, it's not a dog, it's a lion, which, I'm be real, bro, this thing? This looks like a dog to me, but I, I guess it's a lion. Well, actually, now that I look at it, I guess I can see some lion features. Obviously, we got a bunch of omen stuff going on here through the horns. So maybe this person is somewhat fused to the whole lion thing. As a matter of fact, you can even see that he's got two sets of teeth. So there's the set of teeth that would be whatever the, the lion. The, we're talking about a, a Chinese lion. Not sure if you guys have ever seen those where people have the, the big uh, mask thing and then they just dance around. Um, but yeah, we got two set of, two sets of teeth here, so maybe this one is the organic set of teeth, and he just kind of like merged with its lion mask. But we have some more words from our Lord and Savior Miyazaki here. Uh, this is in the Famitsu interview. In the trailer released with this announcement, the weapons are also something to look forward to. Additionally, a never-before-seen enemy resembling a lion dance appeared in the trailer. Is that a boss in the DLC? Yes, that lion dance is, in a sense, a boss characteristic of the DLC. Land of Shadow is actually the place where America became a god, and the golden tree was born. Interesting. The golden tree was actually born here. Then she took the tree to the lands between. She stole it. And that's why these other trees are rotting. Maybe the earth tree is the soul of these trees. Naturally, there's a culture that predates the golden tree. And that lion dance is a character derived from that culture. So I hope players will feel a hint of different culture from the main game. 
So this was like a culture in this uh, zone. Another important thing is with all of the omen stuff coming out of here, right? And considering that some of the children of, of America, like for instance, Mog and uh, Morgoth, they were also born with omen, and that would signify that they haven't been blessed by the earth tree. Kind of like symbolizes her lineage tracing back all the way to the land of shadow. This thing looks vicious. That's probably that flight. And it's got thunder too. Mother. And now here we have Mesmer the Impaler. Wouldst thou truly lordship sanction? He's got flames very much uh, similar to Ricard. Uh, I say Ricard. I'm supposed to say Ricard. I'm sorry. I'm Portuguese, okay? Sometimes I mess up pronunciations. But yeah, he's got the, a very similar flame to the one from Ricard. And an interesting thing is, is I, this one, is also closed very similarly to that of Melina. What's the relationship there? Don't know. His hair, red like Radagons. What's the relationship there? Don't know. But fundamentally, we do have some details on him that I'm going to give you guys at the end of the trailer because there's plenty of more stuff to watch. The rest of light. Okay, so here, new weapons. Let's go over some new weapons, shall we, gentlemen? Will there be new weapons, magic, or prayers added? Yes, many weapons, spells, and battle arts will be added. This is one of the highlights of this DLC, especially for weapons. Eight new weapon types will be added. Of course, there will also be additions to existing weapon types. Eight new types of weapons. So we're talking about stuff like straight swords, hammers. There's eight new of those. Uh, eight new weapon types. There are already a significant number of weapons in the main game, but what specific types of weapons will we add in the DLC? First, there are relatively orthodox directions, like the large Japanese swords and ver reverse grip swords. Reverse grip swords is actually the one that we're watching in the trailer right now. See how he's holding the sword with a reverse grip? That's what we're watching right now. Same thing for the other hand. And this is the, the one that does like that move where he kind of like dodges to the side and then stabs dude in the back. It's an interesting move set, but I don't really see it as being my personal play style, but whatever. Um, you know, reverse grip swords is a more distinctive, innovative direction. For example, there's hand-to-hand -hand combat, which we're about to see in the trailer, inspired by monks, and dueling shields, which integrate offense and defense. There's also throwing daggers, where all attacks are throwing motions. I think those who have used all the weapon types in the main game will find something fresh to enjoy. By the way, nobody's used all the weapon types in the main game. There's too many, okay? There's just too many. <laughs> too many movesets. This is the throwing daggers that he was talking about. This is some new spells. The monk kick, dude. We have to re-watch the monk kick. Also, let me lower the volume even a bit more. I still think this stuff is really loud. My apologies. I'm doing this on the fly, okay? So that monk kick, one, two things instantly came to mind, by the way. Number one, the Sekiro high kick. If you guys remember, Sekiro had a high kick, which I loved. I thought it was a fantastic move because it would lie whenever somebody would do a, like a low sweep or something. They're like, oh, I'm going to jump. This is boom. Kick you in the face. I love that. But it also reminded me of uh, Dark Souls 2. I don't know if you guys remember, and I personally don't remember exactly which DLC it was. I think it might have been the Snow DLC. But in one of the DLCs in Dark Souls 2, you, would, you were eventually able to go to an arena, and there would be like a fist weapon, I think is what it was, and you'd equip that, and after you equip that, your character would essentially become a martial artist. So I'm assuming they're bringing that back, and they're maybe adding some different moves to it or something. It'll be very interesting to see. I think it's a nice niche weapon. Not sure if it's going to be something that I'm interested in, but, you know, it's a cool thing. And also, this dude is a boss. Because you can see the fog wall behind him. So whatever knight we're fighting here, he's considered a boss. Then we see this dude throw in a big explosive pot, and I'm just thinking to myself, please don't be a consumable. Please be something that I can just use repeatedly and relentlessly, because I would love to just throw grenades all over the place. This sounds like a fantastic time. But if it's a consumable, it's going to happen the same thing that always happens with me, which is I'm going to need it later, so I'm never going to use it. I 
presume you too are keen to know. Repeating crossbow. Berserk inspired, obviously. And then we also have uh, this bear spell. Reminds me of that dragon incantation where you do a big dragon roar, except this one is some type of omen bear with bad teeth. Kind is doing this character reminds me a lot of the dancer of the Boreal Valley. I think there's some clear inspiration there. Uh, but yeah, I, I don't know too much about it other than that. It's a beautiful scenery. Probably a boss fight. This dude has one of my favorite weapons that we've seen so far from the DLC. I like this spear. This is probably some gravity powers or whatever, because usually that's what purple signifies, which bothers me a little bit, because it means that probably if I want to use it, I'm going to need to have intelligence, which I usually don't have on my builds. But, you know, maybe I'll do some hybrid strength intelligence build or whatever to run through the... The DLC. I'll, I'll, I'll figure it out. We'll, we'll see. We'll see what comes out of it. But he's also riding on a boar, which is pretty badass. And here we have a hippo. And the hippo's got this spell that he does. And I'm assuming that this is going to be a big boss fight. And probably after you kill this dude, you get this particular spell. Because... Where is it? Here it is. Porky spell. I called this this image Porky Spell, but you can see that the player character is going to get that at some point and just like like porcupine twigs lash out from your character. This, this seems like it's going to be some type of uh, faith spell and incantation or something like that. So yeah, keep that in mind. Another thing is that I forgot to show you guys. There was another another image of the the monk high kick as well, which is pretty cool looking. Now, this dude, I'm not exactly sure who the hell this guy is at all. This just seems like a new boss. He's got like a, a horse that's all busted up, fused to the ground. He's got a skeletal look to him. Uh, he, he has a face that is somewhat similar to this creature. Well, I guess not quite. I mean, he's got the blue eyes. But, yeah, I just didn't, I don't exactly know what to say about this creature. I just, just see this blue long boy in here. Have no idea what he's about, but he's in the website, so I was like, I, I don't know. Closest thing to that is this dude, but, yeah. No. I'm assuming that we're going to be able to get that weapon, uh, the, the boomerang that he's throwing. So, that might be an interesting thing. And here we see the same dude that we saw earlier on the painting. Uh, let me see if I can find the painting for you guys real quick. Those who don't remember, but this is pretty much same dude. Where was that? Ah, oh, whatever. He's, he was the dude on the painting, all right? He's got the same brush and everything. And he's got this uh, twig that almost seems like it's a twig from the, um, from the earth tree. Because it's like all glowy and ordery and whatnot. But, yeah. Now, in here, I also want you to pay attention to the dialogue because I couldn't even hear it through the, the music the first time around, which is why I turned on captions. Those stripped of the grace of gold shall all meet death. Those stripped of the grace of gold shall all meet death. In the embrace of Mesmer's flame. In the embrace of Mesmer's flame. All those stripped of golden grace, which again, if we go back here divesting himself of his flesh, his strength, his lineage of all things golden. So to me, this kind of puts our boy Mesmer directly at odds with, um, with uh, McKellen. Come now, touch the withered arm and travel to the realm of shadow. And by the way, I have a suspicion about who this female voice is because I heard a lot of people say it's like, "Oh, is it Melina? We're gonna we're gonna get back with uh, with Melina. Mel is gonna help help us." I think it's Millicent. I checked a lot of voices. I checked Melania's voice. Checked Melina's voice. Checked Millicent's voice. And when I got to Millicent, I was like, "Maybe I'm wrong," but that would be my theory. I think that this is Millicent. Here is where we also see uh, a shield. We, we see some twin blades on one hand, and then we see the duelist shield, which Miyazaki referred to earlier as the duelist shield. 
uh, which has some type of spear thing to it. It even has a, a leaping attack that we see. Sorry. Those stripped of the grace of gold shall all meet death in the embrace of restless flame. Come now. See how he's got like this attack that he's doing with the thing. It's like, I really wish from software would give me a good shield for proper just shield slamming. But it looks like this is what they're going for, which is interesting. I kind of want to try this out. This feels to me like it'll be a quality weapon, either quality or dexterity. But eh, I don't know. I hope it's got some unique mechanics to it. Touch the withered arm and travel to the realm of shadow. I will not be far behind May we meet again. See the Crucible Knights move there as well. I'll not be far behind. We'll meet again. Again, I think that's Millicent, but I could be wrong. I don't know. And then here we have Mikula. And he's doing something to the, uh, to the earth tree. But wrapping things up, we have some uh, descriptions here for Mesmer. This one is from the Famitsu interview. <clears throat> in the main game, a heroic epic was depicted. Will that theme remain unchanged in the DLC? Yes, the theme of the heroic epic remains unchanged. The character Mesmer, depicted in the key art, is a clear example. He is also one of the heroes. The chair Mesmer is sitting on, this one, is the same one that was on the stage of the battle with the Omen King Mog in the main game. And he is also considered an equal to Godric, Melania, Radon, Ricard, they say Ricard here, it's Ricard, and others being called a child of America. So most likely this is a child of America. He even calls her mother throughout the um, throughout the trailer, even though whether or not that's actually him speaking and referring to Marika is open to interpretation. But, you know, then we also have a little bit more from the IGN interview. Okay, I'm just going to skip to the last one if it's okay, but what can you tell me about the man in red with snakes and flames that's kind of like the focal point of this DLC trailer? <clears throat> yes, we can speak to this character a little bit. This is, as you say, a key figure of this DLC. We believe he will be officially revealed to be Mesmer by the time the trailer goes live. And yes, he's a key figure in the DLC, and he again has this important element of shadow to him, which is a key theme throughout the DLC as well. This is where I was getting the whole, you know, yin and yang vibes, shadow of the earth tree. Could this be that this light that's coming through is the actual earth tree? And, you know, I, I don't know. Just again, theories, theories, theories. And you may have seen at the end of the trailer, there was this piece of key art where it shows Messer sat on a throne-like chair. This is the same thing he told Famitsu. People who play the game may recognize the throne to be one of the, from the boss room where you battle Morgoth. Interesting. And the... In the Famitsu interview, they say this is the same throne uh, with the battle with the Omen King Mog. And in here, it's he talks about it's, it's Morgoth. But it's kind of the same thing. It's probably the same chair anyway. This represents the thrones at the base of the Earth Tree. And it's supposed to symbolize that the Mesmer stands on equal footing with these other demigods and children of America who sat around in these thrones and held the rooms of the Earth Tree. So it's an important figure who rivals those these other demigods. And as you play the DLC, you will learn a little about why he wasn't featured in the Legends of the Earth Tree, the lands between. You'll realize why he exists in this shadow, this land of shadow. So now one of the important things is going to be, okay guys, what about uh, difficulty? And this is actually one of the really interesting things. I talked with Ratatosker about this and some theories that he had, which was very interesting. So on the IGN interview, uh, they say that some, this might, the game is maybe a little bit too hard for casual, uh, the, the DLC might be a little bit too hard for casual Elden Ring players. So with all that said, how do you approach difficulty with a DLC such as this? Our general approach to difficulty has, of course, not changed with Elden Ring. We want to create a challenging experience that tests the players and that gives them a feeling of satisfaction and accomplishment when they get through these struggles. However, we do want to stress there's still a freedom of approach and breadth of strategy to these encounters. I mean, yeah, for starters, when it comes to Elden Ring, you can just leave if you're facing off against the boss that's too hard just leave come back later figure it out just come back later you'll be fine okay um 
And that means both how you approach them if you want to face these challenges or come back later and circumvent them and find another way around and come back when you're ready. This same philosophy is taken in Shadow of the Earth Tree and again to our more hardcore players they will find optional bosses who have been tuned in a similar way to the likes of Melania who I'm sure you remember from the base game who are not crucial so this would be an optional boss. And then you know the IGN interviewer goes like, oh, God. <laughs> and Miyazaki says, yeah, you might remember her. They're not crucial to the completion of the DLC, but they are an optional extra to help challenge for those who are so inclined. That said, there may be another boss on exactly the same level as Melania, but we feel like this is somewhere that we've paid close attention to. Uh, there may not be another boss in the exact same level as Melania. This is something we've paid close attention to. This level of challenge and offering that same level of freedom and we hope that players are able to blossom in the land of shadow the same way that they were in the lands between. He then corrects himself and says, actually, I want to redress that. It's not the fact that it's only a lesser level to Melania, but we have prepared bosses on that with that similar mindset within the DLC area, ones that will challenge the player and hopefully be as memorable as Melania was. Now, one of the interesting things when it comes to DLCs for you know, from software games. This is one of the problems that they've had, and this is one of the things that I was talking with Rad Tosker about, is that sometimes, you know, people level up a lot. Then they get to the DLC, things are too easy. Or sometimes people don't level up enough, and they get to the DLC, and things are too hard. It's very hard because of the degree of freedom that we usually get when it comes to from software DLC, it's kind of hard to balance those DLCs to accommodate for everyone's playstyle. So an interesting thing that was brought up in the Famitsu interview was that since it's playable from the latter half of the main game, will the difficulty level be relatively high? Yes, the difficulty level in terms of parameters will be based on the latter half of the main game. Basically, our approach to difficulty hasn't changed from the main game. There's freedom in challenging threats, and like Melania in the main game, there are tough bosses that don't necessarily need to be defeated as part of the story. Now, the thing here is, they had these questions in different portions of the interview and whatnot, but this is like one of the most important things to me personally was, are there new elements unique to the DLC? And Miyazaki says, system-wise, there are level-up elements exclusive to the DLC. So we're talking about a new stat that only works in the Land of Shadows. That's at least my interpretation of this. Uh, you can think of it as something similar to the attack power in Sekiro Shadows Die Twice, where there's an attack power that is only effective in the DLC's fields separate from traditional levels. I didn't even remember this system. It's been so long since I played Sekiro. I did not even remember. But there was something where you could trade in boss souls and it would increase your attack power. And I believe it can go up to like 99 or something like that. I don't even remember using it that much. So I, I don't know how much of a difference that would make. But it seems that they're using a mechanic similar to that to dictate how strong you're going to be in the DLC. So that even if you go in there and you're level 700 plus or whatever, there might be some challenge still to you if you don't engage with this attack power system. Maybe. I don't know. Again, this is all wild speculation at this point. But the system is there. And there's a system that only works in the DLC fields, only in the Land of Shadow. So I'm thinking of like something specific like uh, Order Power or something like that, right? Where it allows you to face off against the shadow, the, the shadows that you fight in the Land of Shadow. Maybe, I don't know. This was prepared for the sake of freedom and challenging threats, making it easier to experience things like this boss is tough, so let's explore elsewhere, get stronger, and then come back even at high levels. So even if you're like, you know, 700 plus, you can still get stronger using this particular system. I'm expecting this to basically be a separate progression system that is going to dictate, you know, give you proper progression throughout the DLC instead of just getting there and being able, being able to destroy everything. On the other hand, by limiting the increase in attack power, you can also experience challenging threats at a lower level. So if you feel like, oh, things are too easy, don't increase the attack power. Not necessarily the best approach, because I always like no, I always like leveling up. I like le I like progressing. So I'm hoping that it's not too easy to just become completely busted. Then again, I say this, and then I'm gonna just get destroyed because I haven't played Elden Ring in so long. Muscle memory is gonna be dead. It's gonna be, it's gonna be interesting. Now another thing was, will the progression of the DLC affect the ending of the main game? This is in case people are wondering, am I gonna be able to, you know, get a different ending or something like that? No. 
There's not going to be anything like that, nor will the progression of events in the main game change the content of the DLC. The story of the DLC is self-contained and can be considered complete within the DLC. The mystery deepens, but I'm looking forward to new encounters. It's a bit early to ask, but will there be a dedicated ending after clearing the DLC area? There won't be a standalone ending or credits rolling. However, the completion of the DLC is adjusted to be clear, and there are some small productions prepared for that purpose. So there is going to be an end at some point to the DLC, naturally, but there's not going to be a new in-game ending that the DLC unlocks, which I think a lot of us expected to get, like, you know, if you go into the lands between, not the lands between, go into the land of Shadow, you're going to be able to get a different rune or whatever that you then place in the, in the thing and get a different ending, that's not going to be the case. Uh, he was also asked about whether he would like to do more DLC for Elden Ring. And Miyazaki said, no, at the moment, there's no plans for another DLC after this one. In terms of DLCs added to the main game of Elden Ring, this will be a significant milestone. However, that doesn't mean everything about Elden Ring is concluded. I might have said the same thing during Dark Souls 3, but I don't want to make definitive statements that close off future possibilities. Another important thing to mention here is that From Software actually bought the whole rights to Elden Ring. So, because for those of you who don't understand how this works, usually the publisher ends up with the rights. This is one of the reasons why a lot of times people are asking from software, when are you guys going to make Bloodborne? And from software is like, Bloodborne is not ours. We made it. Sony owns it. The publisher usually owns the IP. So in this case, Bandai Namco owned uh, Elden Ring, but from software actually bought the rights to Elden Ring, which is interesting because they haven't really done that for Bloodborne, or maybe, or maybe Sony just decided not to sell I'm not sure, but this does let them do whatever the hell they want with the IP, basically, is what I'm getting at. So if they want to do an Elden Ring 2 or 50 more DLCs, they don't even have to publish those through Bandai Namco if they choose not to do so. Not just DLC, but a bundled version, including the main game and DLC, has also been decided. This is just them saying there's going to be a special bundle that has the game plus the DLC, and they're going to be releasing that for people to buy. Yes, I'd be very happy if this opportunity leads to new players trying Elden Ring. As I mentioned earlier, you need to have progressed to a certain point in the main game to head to the DLC's fields, so it might be a good idea to conquer the main game before the DLC release. Then finally, because this video is already so freaking long, <laughs> do you have the desire to create another game on the scale of Elden Ring? And this is a very interesting question because usually most developers, after they do a big project, it, it almost seems like they get burned out, right? A lot of developers, after they do something big, they might even leave the studio, go work on an indie game or something of a smaller size project, right? So this is usually whenever, at least from my experience, whenever I see a developer that's worked on a huge project, they either take a big break, they're like, I don't even want to talk about other projects, man. I don't, don't talk to me about video games right now. I just came off of making the biggest game of my life, okay? Let me relax. Miyazaki just like straight up, yes, I do. I'm not sure if I can start working on it immediately, but I'd like to try if I'm allowed. Like, he's ready to go. He's like, yeah, I'll tackle another project on the scale of Elden Ring. Let's go. We must protect this man at all costs, okay? And uh, he says, I think the staff feels the same, but we want to utilize the experience from Elden Ring more than anything. Creating a vast world and adventure is truly enjoyable and exciting, which is a very good thing to hear. But, uh, yeah, that is all of the information that I could scrounge up. Hopefully you guys enjoyed the video. If you did, leave it a like. It would really help considering the length of it, especially YouTube is not going to be very kind for me. But uh, yeah, that's going to be it. I'll see you guys in the next one. Stay strong. Stay safe. Peace out.